This is a lecture about how to uh, write models with financial frictions and uh, how to uh, solve models with financial frictions. And uh, I'm going to introduce a number of methods and show how they fit together and give various examples. Um, and I'm going to use the whiteboard. Um, and uh, so um, I guess the goal is you know, to help you um, write, uh, uh, write your own model how you want it and uh, solve it. So basically the goal is to, to basically present some techniques and maybe you find something useful and you can uh, borrow those things. Uh, and uh, so when I was a graduate student, I remember this, uh, this thing that Tom Sargent said that you know, before writing a model, um, you know, if you write a model, you should imagine, you know, who are going to be the people in your model and actually, you know, imagine them, you know, what, what they want and uh, what they choose and, and basically, you know, imagine that, that whole world. Uh, and uh, if you cannot even imagine it, don't even, don't even start. So, so imagine that world that, that they live in. Um, and so... So you begin writing your model with uh, financial frictions, and it's like, um, so you have a, you want to understand the, the big picture, right? Uh, so you have a, a, this uh, canvas, and you start, you know, painting on it, and uh, this, this canvas is, uh, is your state space, so the, this whole state space. Um, and uh, why it is that you want to uh, understand the whole big picture is that because um, sort of like you want to understand the whole system and how it's uh, uh, connected. So uh, if you think about policy, for, for example, you can think about, well, once you end up in a crisis, you know, what's the uh, best policy uh, once you are already there, found yourself? In the, in the crisis. Uh, but another question as well, like what's the big picture? How does it affect the uh, incentives overall? Does it create moral hazard, for example? Do, do, do bailouts create moral hazard? If bailouts, if they happen occasionally, then... Uh, so, so that's why you want to understand how the whole system is uh, connected and how the, uh, the different parts uh, interact. And uh, uh, so... so so this is this is this is where you start painting, and this is this is let's say your state space. Okay, so basically, what is a state space? So in models with uh, financial frictions, one thing that is important, as Marcus was uh, uh, saying, uh, is uh, the distribution of wealth. So it's important uh, how much uh, capital the intermediaries have, how much uh, risk absorption capacity do they have, and uh, if they suffer losses, then this, this can create spillover. So for that reason, the distribution of wealth is going to be important. Um, and uh, in, uh, uh, I think in all of the examples that I showed today, that's going to be the only state variable. But, uh, you know, you may want to write a model where this is one of the state variables, but another state variable could be uh, some, some state of the technology or, you know, some, something else. So maybe a model with the regime uh, switches. Um, and uh, so what are, what are some of the building blocks? So <coughs> one of the things is basically uh, the distribution of assets. So allocation. So if you want to talk about fire sales, then uh, uh, some uh, people uh, fire sell assets to uh, other people, so then the allocation of assets changes. Uh, and uh, what is uh, the uh, allocation of uh, assets? Um, what is it related to? So. Uh, So it's related to uh, allocation of uh, risk, 
Okay. Uh, so, so these assets they can be held because with, with leverage. So uh, some institutions may be levered, <coughs> and uh, when you take on leverage, then you take on more risk. Then you're more likely to uh, get in trouble. So allocation of risk is is connected to the allocation of uh, assets. And then another thing that's connected to the allocation of assets is, uh, um, I guess, uh, output and growth. So if you allocate assets more uh, towards productive agents, then you have more output and uh, uh, more growth. Uh, so this is only a part of the big picture. Uh, so, so what is uh, related to the allocation of risk is uh, risk premium. Okay, so risk premium, the risk premium is basically uh, somebody requires compensation for taking on risk, and uh, if somebody takes on a lot of risk, then uh, you know they. They do it because they expect that they're going to uh, earn something from risk taking. And so, what you want to think about is the whole equilibrium. So, this, uh, the risk premium, they're, they're going to be connected with the allocation of risk. Okay. Um, and then, uh, uh, and then consumption. So uh, decisions, you know, how much, how much to consume, and how the different agents to consume. So you'll have to have some type of relationship between, uh, so uh, the market clearing for consumption. Okay, this is going to be uh, one of the relationships. So uh, it's the relationship between total output and uh, uh, total consumption. Okay, and then of course, uh, what happens in the middle is that um, you care about how the whole wealth distribution is shifted. So, um, so we want to take a step back and look at the whole dynamics. Then uh, the whole wealth distribution is shifting. So, um, wealth distribution. Okay. Uh, let me write well properly. Okay, and this is going to be some type of a stochastic uh, law of motion. So there are some shocks to the system. The shocks, they uh, because of the shocks. You know, some some uh, agents win and some agents lose, and the wealth distribution is changing. Uh, and so, the wealth distribution is going to move around. And because somebody suffers losses, then there may be fire cells and, and so on and so forth. Okay. But uh, one of the equations is going to be the slow motion of wealth distribution. And uh, what it depends on, so. In the short run, it basically depends on the uh, allocation of risk. So it has a, a stochastic component. So uh, if you know uh, how risk is distributed, then basically you you can find uh, how how wealth distribution can uh, can shift, and if this can cause prices or if uh, this cannot cause crisis. Um, um, and this is in the short run. But in the long run, um, for example, if you want to know the whole stationary distribution of wealth or how wealth moves around the, over, over the long run, 
then uh, um, this is just the volatility. Then you also want to know the drift. And the drift is connected to basically these two things. Okay? Because uh, if somebody is uh, consuming faster, they're going to deplete their wealth. Okay? And uh, uh, if somebody earns a high risk premium, then you'll be able to recover faster from uh, crisis. What else is important? It's basically, um, these, uh, these agents, they will be forward-looking. Okay, so they have to look forward and they have to anticipate, you know, there may be fire sales and in these cases there may be some investment opportunities to pick up these assets at fire sale prices. Uh, or, you know, maybe the there will be some uh, some situations where they become constrained, so they have to look for it. And so something else that you will also need the value functions. Okay. Uh, so um, and these value functions. Um, <coughs> so the value functions they are they basically summarize the future, uh, and. Uh, uh, and from the value functions, we can determine what are the risk premia. So risk premia, they um, reflect some expectations of the, on the future. Um, precautionary motive, okay, whether people want to consume or they want to cut down their consumption. Uh, and I think that, uh, so, so basically that's, that's the full uh, circle. Okay, so to make things uh, concrete, uh, I'm going to give one specific example of a, a model, and uh, and then I'm going to talk about these various building blocks. So this is. Um, Yeah, let's, so let me just give us an example, uh, the model from uh, uh, the paper that they have with Marcus, the ER paper. So it's, it's an economy that are experts in households. It's a very basic economy. So uh, experts in households, they can use capital for production. Uh, and capital is a, a risky asset. So uh, the low motion of... Uh, So new capital can be built uh, through investment, uh, and capital is, uh, uh, so there are some shocks that uh, affect uh, basically how much capital uh, there is in the economy. So this is the whole productivity of capital in the economy. Uh, this is, this is the growth rate, uh, and uh, output is, uh, the assumption here is that the experts, they're more productive at using this capital, and so from capital they can produce output A, but the households, they can only uh, get output A underlined. Uh, which is less than a uh, per unit of capital. Uh, and uh, uh, some of the output can be invested, so some of the output is invested, so this goes into, into investment. Okay. Let me write you know, this corner and then this corner. Okay. But, but what's down there is that there is productivity of capital A and productivity of capital A underlined. Okay. Is of uh, experts in households. So let's say that uh, they have CRRA utility um, with risk of 
version gamma. Uh, in parentheses, log k says uh, gamma equal to 1. So these are the preferences. Uh, and uh, and so basically, uh, we are interested in the in the whole dynamics of uh, of this economy. So um, so the assets that people trade. Uh, when we talk about the allocation of assets, the assets that people trade are capital, which is in the whole economy in positive net supply, and uh, the risk-free asset, which is in uh, zero net supply. So uh, there's going to be some uh, risk-free rate. Uh, so let's say that uh, uh, psi, this is the fraction of uh, capital allocated to experts. Um, let's say that, so RF is the risk-free rate. Uh, let's say Q, this denotes the, the price of capital. This is per unit. Okay. And uh, the wealth distribution, so um, so total wealth is Q times K. So so Q when I when I when I say Q, Q is something that changes over time. So, so it's really, uh, it's going to be uh, changing over time. It's going to be a stochastic problem. Uh, and uh, so let me actually write QT. And QT times KT, this is, the, this is total wealth because uh, only capital is uh, in a positive net supply K and risk-free asset is in zero net supply. So this is total wealth. So this is the total wealth. Uh, experts, they have a part of this total wealth. And households, they have a part of this uh, total wealth. So let, let me denote by NT, this is uh, uh, experts wealth. And uh, let me denote wealth share. Nt over Qt Kt. This is the expert's wealth. And this is this is uh, one state variable, and uh, capital K, the total amount of capital in this economy, is another state variable. Uh, but uh, uh, everything ends up being scale invariant in, in K, so you can keep uh, uh, eta the same, and you can scale up K or down, and because uh, the CRA utility is a scale invariant utility function, uh, the, the price of capital per unit is, is going to be only a function of eta, and uh, the allocation of capital to experts is only going to be a fraction of eta. Now, uh, this is the point at which I wish I was as tall as Marcus, because uh, it's a signet right in the bottom, we have to write on top. Uh, so, so let me, uh, so suppose that you want to understand the, the dynamics of, uh, uh, in this economy, then what are the things that we may want to understand? So one of the things is uh, the allocation of assets. Okay, so, so here, Basically, the allocation of assets uh, is a function of uh, of the state, and the and the state variable is uh, is just an, just an interval from from zero to one. This is just the uh, fraction of wealth uh, that belongs to experts, 
And uh, when the fraction of wealth that belongs to experts, when it's a low number, then uh, experts, they become constrained uh, because, uh, uh, because they have uh, little wealth. And uh, if they want to hold all capital in the economy and get this uh, high output rate, then they have to absorb all of the risk with, with their little wealth. So the, the, uh, the lower is their wealth share, the more risk they will be exposed to uh, in order to hold all of the capital in the economy. And at some point they'll say, okay, you know, uh, we sell some of the capital to households because it's more important for us to get rid of uh, uh, a part of the risk than, uh, than to earn this high output rate. So, so this is the allocation of assets is going to be on the, on the vertical axis for this economy, essentially. Okay. And this is uh, uh, this is one characteristic. So, sorry. So this is. Um, This is one, okay, and this is a function that they're basically. Uh, so for low levels of uh, wealth, the experts they will choose to sell some of the capital to households, even though households are less productive. Okay, so what about the uh, uh, the allocation of risk. Uh, so, so this is the uh, the wealth share of experts, and let me plot the volatility of of wealth share of experts on the vertical axis. So, uh, there is a positive shock to capital, then uh, the households in this region, okay, let's talk about this region. If there is a positive shock to, uh, to capital, then uh, the wealth of the household does not change because the households in this region, they just hold the risk-free asset. Uh, but uh, the experts, they, uh, their wealth goes up, so basically a positive shock is, is going to uh, r raise the relative wealth of, of experts. And uh, this effect is going to be bigger when, uh, when the experts are, uh, uh, are poorer. So, 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 so maybe let me, let me add this one more graph and uh, <coughs> plot the, the leverage of experts. So uh, the leverage of experts, let's say I want to plot Q times K times Psi over, uh, over N. So this is the total value of, uh, which, is, which is also equal to, I guess, Psi over, over eta. So this is the total value of capital that experts hold. This is their net worth. And uh, uh, this ratio... Uh, is going to look like a, a, it's going to look like one over eta until fire sales start, and uh, this is leverage. Uh, and from that point onwards. 
files that are going to start. So, so basically, the the export stable. try to uh, keep their leverage in check. Okay, so the, um, the volatility of the state variable is increasing uh, in, uh, as, uh, as either goes down from one uh, up until the point where, where fire cells start. Uh, and then uh, after that, so what one may guess what is going to happen in the fire cells region is that basically that the experts they're going to uh, uh, sell some of the capital and because of that uh, the, the volatility is, is going to go down so that would be the guess one could make okay but uh, but actually what is going to happen is that in the fire cells region one thing that's going to happen is that the price of capital is going to be very volatile so basically, there's going to be uh, endogenous risk in this region. So, so if I plot, uh, if I plot, for example, Q, then Q is going to look something like this. So, so Q looks like this, and then the, when the fire sales uh, region it it drops. Okay. So basically, the more experts uh, sell capital to households, the more uh, price gets depressed and then because of that um, basically sigma q the volatility of the price of capital is, is going to be high here okay and what this is going to cause is that this is going to cause the uh, the volatility to spike up in this in this region So basically, that's that's going to be the goal. And then, and then you can you can get various phenomena, such as uh, um, you have uh, uh, fat tails. Okay. So basically, the uh, the asset returns is uh, that uh, uh, after bad shocks, the volatility spikes up, uh, and then uh, uh, the asset returns are, are going to be basically uh, you know, over medium horizons, not like normal, but they're going to have heavy, heavy tails on the bottom because of this effect that the volatility spikes up uh, after fire cells. Um, so, so then, uh, something else which is going to happen in this model is, uh, so this is the volatility of the expert's wealth share, and uh, um, let me draw a separate graph which is the drift of the expert's wealth share. So basically, this is the drift, this is mu of eta times eta, and basically what this depends on is uh, so let me draw the first graph. Okay, looking like this. Okay, so uh, so the volatility depends on uh, uh, risk premium, which depends on the allocation of risk. So how much risk everybody uh, everybody takes, and also depends on on consumption. And what happens uh, in this economy is that the experts, they are levered, they hold more capital than households. Uh, and because, uh, because uh, they are levered, uh, they are going to um, basically um, earn a risk premium on the risk that they take. Okay? Whereas in this region, the households, they earn just the risk rate without the risk premium. And so the drift is, is basically is going to be positive, and when the volatility spikes up in the crisis region, then the drift is, is going to be higher, basically reflecting the, the spike in the risk premium. Okay. And uh, 
if you just look at this graph, then something that you're going to that you can observe is that uh, uh, what's the long ride dynamics of the system is that well, uh, in the because the drift is everywhere positive, what's going to happen in, in the long run is basically the experts they're going to save their way out of the constraint, right? And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, a situation that uh, one uh, uh, always has when one type of an agent is more productive than another type of agent. Basically, the more productive uh, agents eventually save their way up. Coming back to the drift, right? I was talking about the drift. So if experts are more productive than households and nothing else, then eventually experts, they save their way out of the constraint. Uh, but uh, uh, so uh, So, so, so then uh, people put people can put like various other elements of this of this model in order to avoid this. Okay, so uh, the things that people can put in are uh, they can put, for example, uh, that the households they get some labor income. Okay, so basically the the households they have some uh, uh, basically uh, outside earnings that uh, that add to their wealth. Uh, sometimes people put the element that uh, uh, the you know this it's a it's a cheap element uh, which is that uh, the experts there are basically hit by a Poisson shock and uh, then they become households so some of the wealth goes from experts to households. Uh, so another easy trick which uh, Marcus and I use is uh, that you can assume that experts are less patient than households so they're consuming it. At a slightly higher rate. Uh, so another thing that, uh, which, uh, which is, which is, I think, uh, a nice, uh, a nice trick to add, is that basically to assume that well, um, the the households they're also productive at something, um, and uh, if uh, the household net worth becomes. Uh, very low, then uh, uh, there's there's something that the households also hold, and then the, their risk premium is going to rise, which is which is basically going to push the system in the middle. Okay, but either way, let me change this uh, this graph a little bit to to accommodate. So, for example, let's assume that uh, uh, discount rate of uh, experts rho is uh, bigger than r, and this is the, the discount rate of household. Uh, so, so then here the drift is, is positive, and then it's negative, and then somewhere else there's going to be a, a point where the drift is zero. So, so if the system is above this point, then it will tend to drift back towards this point. Uh, and if it's below this point, it will tend to drift up towards this point. So basically, this is going to be, so if you plot the, the stationary distribution, then it could look something like this. Uh, so maybe I'll plot it on the same graph, but I'll use a different marker. So basically, the, the system is going to fluctuate around that point and it's going to be normal, okay, uh, and uh, so it could look roughly normal near this point, uh, but in the crisis region because of the high volatility then you can have a fat tail and you know sometimes you can you could even have a spike there, okay, so basically you could have some situation like this when it comes to the stationary distribution. So then, uh, uh, when you have these graphs, and maybe you could also 
and some other graphs, something about consumption, something about total output, something about growth. So it would be that the output is going to drop in the crisis region, the growth is going to drop in the crisis region. Then basically you see uh, the full picture. So, uh, okay. Any questions? So this is a this is kind of an introduction. You're not supposed to have any questions at this point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. So let me give a roadmap for what I would want to do next. Okay. So um, the first thing that I want to do is I want to um, review some things from uh, uh, asset pricing, optimal consumption and portfolio choice problem. Uh, so in these models, the choice of leverage is basically a portfolio choice problem. It's it's a decision of uh, uh, the portfolio weight and the risky asset. So if you put weight bigger than one, then you're levered. You go short on the risk-free asset, and the leverage choice, the risk-taking choice, uh, it's all consumption and portfolio choice problem. So basically, I want to start by uh, reviewing that. Uh, and uh, the consumption and portfolio choice problem is going to be important uh, in the circle in uh, many places. Okay. So first, uh, the, the equilibrium allocation of assets. Okay. So it's, it's a result of the portfolios that the different agents choose. Okay. Uh, so risk premia are related to consumption portfolio choice problem. The house of wealth distribution evolves. And of course, you know, the value function. So, so basically everything is going to be uh, linked. Plus we have a market clearing condition for uh, consumption. Okay. So um, let me talk about optimal consumption portfolio choice. And I want to try to make it uh, very, very simple. If I can. Okay. So the key the key equation is uh, is the equation that for an agent with discount rate rho generates no dividends or so for for any uh, let me let me say for any uh, trading strategy in which you um, reinvest the dividends so you so you basically you reinvest the dividends and your wealth is growing and your wealth in that trading strategy is equal to 80 so this this has to be a marking guild marking guild for any self financing strategy, meaning like you invest the dividends, available to the agent with value. So uh, the definition of a martingale is that. Uh, uh, There's an expectation this is not going up, neither, neither going down. So Martingale is a process that, you know, it's a stochastic process. It could randomly go up, could randomly go down, but uh, in ex the expect expected change is zero. Okay. So, uh, and uh, 
you know, why is it a fundamental first order condition for uh, optimal consumption portfolio choice problem? Well, because if this is not a martingale, if uh, this is going up an expectation, then it means that the agent's marginal utility from uh, this strategy is, is higher in the future than it is right now. So it means that the agent should consume uh, less right now and should uh, put more money in the trading strategy and, uh, uh, and, uh, and get the proceeds at a future date and consume with them, keeping consumer at the, the marginal utility. Okay, so if it's going up in expectation, then the agent is not uh, doing things optimally. He should long this strategy. Uh, and uh, if this is going down in expectation, then it's the opposite that the agent should short this strategy. And if uh, there's a constraint on uh, short selling, then uh, the condition that this is a martingale has to be replaced with the condition that this is uh, uh, that this can only go down but not up. So it has to be. I'm always confused about which one is which. Uh, it has to be a, a super martingale. No, it has to be a yeah. Get <laughs> myself confused. Uh, but but this this is not important because I think all of them are I think important to be like so, so so I think I think I think somebody is better at, at saying than this this I than I anybody wants to help me? Yeah? I mean it should be a super martingale. I, I learned that it's super what I have right now because it's only going down. Yeah, so super means it's going down. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was very, very smart. <laughs> Thank you, that's true. Uh, okay. So, uh, all right. Um, so, let me, um, let me, uh, derive, uh, let me use it. Okay. So, uh, th this is the basic exercise. So, um, in other words, you can use the marginal utility of the agent as a stochastic discount factor to price asset. Okay. So let me. So this is this. This is a stochastic discount factor. So this is CT, and CT has some law of motion. motion and this uh, you know this is just some writing it with it has some some drift and some volatility and basically I'm writing this and just assuming that well you know let's imagine a world where uh, everything is driven by Brownian motion so all processes there are diffusion processes which can be written with some drift and with some uh, uh, volatility okay. uh, and at this point um, What I want to say is that in uh, in these uh, gross models with financial frictions or without, but when you have a stochastic element, uh, very often, most of the time, it's useful to write uh, processes in in this form, which is uh, which is basically scaled by itself, which is the geometric form, right? So basically, you know, this is the this is like a geometric Brownian motion, except it's different from a geometric Brownian motion because the drift and volatility, they only locally look like a geometric Brownian motion, but they can change over time. Okay. Um, and for processes written in this form, it's also useful to uh, basically, uh, you know, to have, a, to remember by heart certain uh, ethos formulas. So I'll, I'll tell them uh, in a moment. So this is for the stochastic discount factor. And uh, this asset A, so you're investing dividends. So basically, this, uh, uh, the, the value of this trading strategy, you're not getting any dividends out. So the return on A uh, has some drift. Uh, 
expected return and some volatility, this is the risk of that. And the condition that uh, this, this product okay, is a martingale that this product is a martingale is basically a condition which says that the, the drift of the product is, uh, is zero. Okay. So uh, if we have uh, one process and we have another process A, and we want to write down the law of motion of uh, its, uh, the product of the two processes, Then uh, then the drift is going to be, so when C is going up, then the product is going up. When A is going up, then the product is going up. Uh, and it turns out that if you write the, the full drift, then uh, the full drift is going to have uh, this term, it's going to have this term, and it's also going to have a third term, which is which is an ether term. So in ether calculus, you always have this extra term in the drift because of the volatility. So this is the this is the drift of the product, and the volatility of the product is just the sum of uh, volatility. So this fundamental asset pricing condition that this is the market deal, is uh, the condition that uh, the, the drift uh, equals zero. Okay, and uh, let me derive some some implications of of this condition. implication of this condition is that uh, suppose that I apply it to the uh, risk-free asset. Okay, so this is the okay. So if I apply it to the risk-free asset, the risk-free asset has uh, the expected return equal to the risk-free rate. Okay. And uh, the volatility is zero because it's a risk-free asset. Uh, and so, so then what I get is that uh, UPC uh, minus, sorry, plus RF is equal to zero. And uh, what this means is that the, the drift of the stochastic discount factor is uh, minus the risk-free rate. So this is an implication that you can price the risk-free asset with the stochastic discount factor. Okay. And, uh, and this makes sense because stochastic discount factor is, uh, uh, is a discount factor that you use for discounting. Okay, uh, and so uh, ignoring the stochastic portion, just the deterministic is that you know if you're discounting something which is risk-free, well you have to discount it at the at the risk-free rate. You have to discount risk risk-free cash flows at the risk-free rate. So it's not surprising that the drift of the stochastic discount factor is uh, minus the risk-free rate.
So, uh, so let me do another application of uh, of this principle, and suppose that. Uh, Suppose that this agent can invest in asset A and can also invest in, in asset B. So asset B has some return, uh, basically the same formula, right? Should I write it down? I should probably write it down. B D T plus sigma B D D T. So this is the formula for the return of asset B. And uh, so, so basically, suppose I, I write the same formula for pricing asset B, okay? So then I'm going to get exactly the same formula, but this is, this is going to be mu B, and this is going to be sigma B, and this is still uh, C and sigma C, so I'm going to get exactly the same formula, and then uh, and then let me subtract subtract uh, this formula for asset A and the formula for asset B. So for asset B, I have uh, mu C plus mu B plus sigma C sigma B equals zero. Okay, and if I subtract, I'm going to get uh, mu A minus mu B, right? So this uh, mu C is going to cancel out. Uh, and, and, and let me move everything else to the other side. Uh, I'm going to have a, a sigma A minus sigma B. And then uh, let me denote it by Zeta t, so this is minus uh, sigma c, right? And uh, let me call it the the risk premium. Okay. So I could I could also write down uh, over there. This is this is minus sig. Uh, sorry, this is minus. So, so this, what is this equation? This equation says that, well, the difference between expected returns of any two assets, what does it depend on? It depends on uh, the difference between uh, the risk of one asset and another, uh, and, uh, and the risk premium, okay? So the, the different assets, they have different returns to the extent that they have uh, different risks, uh, and this difference in risk is priced at the, at the risk premium. Okay, so if you somehow happen to be in the risk neutral world and the risk premium is zero, then, um, uh, all assets have exact, exactly the same return, the, the risk theory. So, um, so, okay. Um,
So I have to apologize that at this point this is kind of abstract, but what I want to say is that this formula, the red doesn't really write, uh, that this formula is a very important formula, and uh, and this will be useful for uh, many, many parts of this uh, circle. Uh, let me introduce uh, something else, which is a uh, uh, change in numerator. Okay. Uh, so, so A, this is uh, the value of an asset, for example, in dollars. Okay. So, uh, so you may want to, uh, let's say, use another uh, numerator, so for example, uh, euros. And uh, the, the price of a euro and dollar is, uh, is y. So y. Another numerator. So, for example, euro. Okay, mark this favor. Uh, so, okay. So, so then, uh, can I can I write the asset pricing condition in euro? Is that well? Um, so the the. Um, So this is going to be the value of the asset in euro. Okay. Yeah. So, so when you say it's euros, do you mean it's the price of euros in dollars, or what do you mean? Yeah, it's the price. Uh, the price of uh, how much is each euro worth in dollars? Yeah, the price of euros. Okay. But it doesn't have to be euro. It can be, you know, it can be. Any. Okay. Um, So if I want to if I want to do it in euros, then uh, uh, then the, the value of the asset is going to be uh, a t over y t. That's the value of the asset in euros. Okay. Um, and uh, so. So, but if I want to, if I have the price in euros, and if I want to price it properly, then what I want is I want marginal utility, not of dollars, but of euros. The marginal utility of consuming euros. So, so basically, I have to, to adjust marginal utility. In the way that I adjust marginal utility, is just by multiplying. By multiplying by y. Okay. So this is the... This is the marginal utility of, of y, okay? So you're consuming a unit of y, and, and you're getting this marginal utility. So, so instead of you're consuming the whole euro, so you're consuming more than a dollar, uh, and you're getting higher marginal utility. Okay. So this is a market. <coughs> And uh, and and because this is a martingale, I have another asset pricing condition. I can use it just the same way as this one, uh, but uh, I can express all of the returns in in another uh, in another unit. So. Uh, so basically, my asset pricing condition is going to be um, so. Um, so I have to express everything in euros. So so let me write it down. So I have a 
mu a y. This is the return of uh, asset a in y. Okay, and then they have minus mu b y. So return b y. So basically, this is this is the this is the drift of this ratio. Okay. This is the drift of this ratio, and this is the drift of the ratio of b to y, okay? And this is equal to, uh, so my, my risk premium is going to be the volatility of this product rather than the volatility of, uh, so, so what is my risk premium? My risk premium is going to be the minus the volatility of uh, that whole product. So, so my risk premium is going to be uh, minus sigma uh, C, which is the volatility of this part, okay? And then minus sigma Y, which is the volatility of this. So my risk premium is minus the volatility of the stochastic. Uh, By the way, what's the intuition behind it? So, so let me take a step back. So. Um, Uh, a, a return on the asset is going to be bigger, okay, uh, when, uh, when it's an asset which, uh, which goes up uh, when, uh, when the marginal utility is going down, right? So it, which means when, when your consumption is, is going up, so when the return is bigger. So, so if it's an asset which, uh, uh, which has a return when your marginal utility is lower, then you're going to have a higher expected return, and that makes sense because uh, you, you have a higher expected return, but you get more money exactly when, you're, marginal, when you're, you're already consuming a lot, so you don't really need this extra money. So, but this is, this is the... Uh, This is the this is the risk premium in uh, numerator in numerator y, uh, and this difference is uh, so, so of course is the old risk premium minus uh, sigma sigma y. So, so you can already see how this this is kind of useful, because uh, uh, because if you want, if you want, you could you could do a numerator change to basically to get to the risk neutral measure, okay? Because because basically if you do an appropriate numerator change, then uh, this is going to be zero, and then in 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 some units. In some units, there's going to be no risk premium. This, this is kind of convenient, right? So, so how many of you knew that that you could do that? So, some of some of you, quite well, you're you you're you you you're, you know you're really good. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so so what about the the risk? So, um, so this A over Y, uh, it has volatility, okay, so this is Ito's formula for a ratio, okay, so that here's an Ito formula for a product, and Ito formula for a ratio, so you can guess what's the volatility of a ratio, what, what is it? The difference, exactly. So it's uh, sigma A minus sigma Y. Okay? And basically, if, uh, if, if A goes up by 1% exactly at the same time when Y goes up by 1%, so if they have the same, have the same volatility, then the volatility of the ratio is zero because, because those changes are going to cancel out. Right? Okay? 
And because of that, the, uh, the difference in risk is going to be uh, sigma A minus uh, sigma B. Okay? So the, the next observation that I want to make is that uh, if you look at the, the difference in, uh, in risk, then it doesn't depend on the numerator which, which you used to, to measure it, uh, because uh, the, the numerator part is, is going to cancel out. Okay. So basically, this is, this, is, this is the same regardless of numerator. any uh, stochastic process, you know, basically just multiplying and dividing by the, by the same thing, and, uh, and, the, and sometimes the, the using the right numerator makes things very convenient. Okay, so let me move on and let me talk about uh, uh, other parts, to, to talk about the various parts of the circle, and, you know, when necessary, I'm going to, to come and I'm basically going to draw from this. Okay. So uh, let me talk about uh, the allocation of assets. to maybe use some capital and get some, some funds from various investors. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and this firm uh, can have some, uh, basically, some, some generate some profit, so it could have some, some dividend uh, output. Going to have some growth, okay. Um, so basically, it's going to generate some some return to its investor. Uh, and uh, and it's it's going to get some funding from various investors. So it could have some debt. Could have some. Uh, uh, Some equity, okay. Some of the equity could be uh, held by a firm insider, so maybe has some managerial compensation, okay. And uh, uh, there is a whole corporate finance literature which uh, basically looks at uh, uh, financial frictions and. Uh, uh, and what the literature basically studies is it studies capital structure, so how the firm uh, finances itself, and how various types of capital structure give incentives to, let's say, managers, what kinds of you know, conflicts of, of interest uh, between equity holders and uh, debt holders arise. So ultimately, the capital structure can create various types of capital structure can either, you know, help solve the incentive problems or create additional incentive problems. And these incentive problems, they're basically going to be inefficiencies that are going to affect the, the output and, and the growth and ultimately the, the firm's return. Okay. Uh, and so, uh, 
So let me, you know, motivated by this picture, let me think about, uh, uh, let me, let, let's think about uh, the model of the firm in the, in the following form. So, so basically this, this firm is going to generate some return to, uh, to all of its uh, uh, stakeholders, debt holders and, and equity holders. So this return is going to be a function of a, a capital structure. So psi, this is capital structure. So various types of capital structures, you know, can can have you know various types of uh, agency problems, and uh, in this uh, and one aspect of a capital structure is basically uh, the the return that the firm generates. That that's one aspect, and then another aspect is um, uh, basically that as a function of capital structure there is going to be uh, some risk. So the firm is going to be risky. And uh, this sigma, this is the allocation of risk uh, among stakeholders. And in models, in uh, classic asset pricing models, it's uh, complete markets. Everybody has uh, the same risk premium. Okay. But in models with financial frictions, uh, it's imperfect risk sharing. So risk is not shared perfectly among all agents. So different agents have a different risk premium. And uh, basically, this is, this is a vector of a... Uh, 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 allocation of risk, and this is uh, uh, this is the vector of risk premium. Vector of risk premium. Okay. So this vector of risk premium will depend on where you are uh, in this system. Okay. And uh, one good general way of thinking about it is basically what you want to uh, and this is expected return. Okay. So one good way of thinking about it is that if you maximize uh, over all capital structures, the the expected return minus the the cost of risk. So take the take the whole vector of the risk that the different. Uh, uh, stakeholders get get their respective risk premium. Okay, so the optimal capital structure basically solves this problem to to, to maximize this, right? Uh, and uh, and I guess in a in a competitive market, uh, uh, what you're going to get from choosing an optimal capital structure is uh, just the required return. So. So this is going to be equal to the risk free rate in competitive. Okay, so this is sort of a corporate finance uh, foundation of uh, macroeconomies with uh, financial friction. Okay. Um, so um, let me apply this idea to this type of a framework we've talked about before. So this is uh, uh, an economy, and uh, basically uh, the, the capital structure of the economy is the fraction of capital allocated to experts. Okay. And so... Uh, So let me give several examples. And 
basically example one is going to be this this example from the very beginning of the lecture. So here um, the what is going to be the the expected return? So the expected return as a function of psi is uh, that as a function of psi, so psi is the fraction of capital allocated to experts, and uh, then the output when fraction of psi is allocated to experts can be a times psi minus a underlined times uh, one minus psi. Okay, so basically uh, the fraction psi or in, uh, basically <coughs> generates this output. Uh, and uh, this, the fraction 1 and minus psi generates this output, the investment rate is basically the same across groups. But of course, here we're interested in expected return and not expected output. So basically, I have to, I have to divide this by Q, and uh, the expected return is going to be this term plus uh, terms that do not depend on psi. that don't depend on psi. Yes. When you talk about capital structure, do you mean like the equity debt division? Or because in this, it seems to mean something else in this expert example. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, uh, so, so in this case, this, this, is, this is exactly something else. Because, because what happens is, you know, you are basically no, you're dividing the assets physically between uh, uh, experts and households. So, so this is talking about the division of physical assets, right? And this is talking about the, the division of uh, uh, financial assets, that uh, you basically uh, creating various securities, you split the cash flows between the various securities, and you try to, to do it to uh, uh, <coughs> to basically solve this objective. But uh, what I want to claim is that I want to basically convince you that this is a good general way of uh, thinking about this problem, and it applies to. Uh, <coughs> Uh, like many different ways of, of writing the model, including including this one. Okay. Yeah. So, in general, I guess you have to somehow face the Monica Miller theorem when you are saying that it matters what the capital structure is. So. Yeah. Exactly. So, so you assume, so you assume that there is a there are frictions that Modigliani Miller doesn't completely hold it. How you divide the the cash flows. Uh, so, so I mean, here the story is well. Okay, you know, the, there is the financial constraint. You cannot uh, issue any equity. You have to absorb all of the risk yourself. Uh, so you assume that there is this type of a friction, uh, and experts are more productive than households, right? Uh, but if you want uh, like a more subtle, more microfounded, you know, friction, then then you know you could take a uh, you know corporate finance model and you basically look at how uh, splitting the risk, uh, you know, affects managerial incentives. Okay. So basically, so what are those terms? This is basically investment. Investment, growth, and then fluctuations of Q. So, so these people, they are small. They are price takers. They assume that Q changes somehow uh, uh, uh And uh, then you have minus. Uh, how much risk goes to experts? Well, this is the the total risk of capital is sigma plus sigma Q. So the experts they get. Uh, 
fraction psi of this risk, and this risk is, is valued at the expert's risk premium, and uh, fraction 1 minus psi, uh, this is what the households get, and uh, this is valued at the household's uh, risk premium. And, uh, and you maximize this by choosing psi, okay, and then uh, if you maximize it by choosing psi, then you get the first order condition, so you could also be easily at the corner, right, because psi is between 0 and 1, the first order condition is A minus A underlined, divided by Q, uh, equals uh, sigma plus sigma Q, uh, times the difference between the, the risk premium. Okay. And, uh, okay. Um. So, uh, so let me, let me go a little bit further here, but uh, before that, uh, let me come back and uh, let me cover a specific case of, uh, of logarithmic utility. So, so for logarithmic utility, log of t, this is logarithmic utility. Uh, the marginal utility is, uh, so for, for logarithmic utility, it's the case, and this is something you can derive from uh, uh, from this, this condition, that uh, that consumption uh, is uh, proportional to wealth. Okay, and. Uh, of uh, the marginal utility of consumption. So the marginal utility of consumption is uh, uh, 1 over C. Uh, this is equal to 1 over rho times N. Okay. So we are dividing 1, which has no volatility, by n, which has volatility sigma n, and the volatility of that is, uh, uh, so this is, sorry, what I meant to say is that this is equal to the, the volatility of that, which is equal to the volatility of that, which is equal to uh, minus sigma n, okay, and, uh, and therefore, it follows that uh, this risk premium for logarithmic utility, which is uh, uh, minus minus sigma n, so the risk premium is just the volatility of what? So the risk premium is the volatility of well of n. So now uh, let me come back to this example. Okay. So, so if furthermore uh, gamma equal to one, so utility is logarithmic, and suppose that uh, uh, phi of iota equals iota, so no adjustment costs.
which implies that Q is always equal to 1 and sigma Q is equal to 0. Okay. So the, so the first order of condition for investment is that uh, phi prime of iota uh, uh, is equal to 1 over Q. And if you have uh, an investment function without any adjustment costs, then you can always convert one unit of capital into uh, one unit of output and vice versa. So this first sort of condition applies that uh, Q is equal to 1. Okay. So basically, this is, this is a special case. So let me make a, a comment about this special case. So Marcus was talking about various types of uh, illiquidity earlier. Okay. So there is uh, funding illiquidity, there is uh, uh, market illiquidity, and there is uh, uh, technological uh, illiquidity, right? Uh, and so uh, technological illiquidity is basically the adjustment costs, basically how you convert, uh, how, how you can adjust by investing or, or disinvesting how many frictions, how, how, how strong are the frictions there. That's the technological uh, illiquidity. And then the market illiquidity is basically the potential for the price of capital to fall because of the fire sales. The market illiquidity is related to the difference between A and A underlined. Okay. And uh, funding illiquidity, this has to do with basically the frictions on this side, the, the funding frictions. And so here, uh, in this specific case, there is a market uh, uh, illiquidity, but uh, technologically it's... There's, there are no uh, frictions to adjusting, which, which implies that, that, you know, that basically Q is equal to 1. So, so in this case, there's going to be no endogenous risk. The risk becomes uh, completely uh, absorbed by uh, adjustment in investment. And it's logarithmic utility. So, so in this case, what I want to do is I want to solve for psi in closed form. Psi in closed form. Okay. Because in general, well, how, what the allocation of capital it has to satisfy this equation depends on the risk premia, which, uh, which are endogenous, because the risk premia are connected to people's expectations and the value function and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, in this spe special case, it's a nice case because it's possible to solve uh, in close form. So let's see what, what happens here. So, so for logarithmic utility, for a logarithmic utility, uh, the risk premium is the, of experts is the volatility of wealth of uh, experts, which is... Uh, Uh, the volatility of capital that they hold, which is psi times sigma, divided by their net worth, which is eta. Okay, so this is the this is the volatility of wealth of, of experts. So there there are basically two reasons for for this formula. The first reason is because uh, the volatility of capital is is sigma plus sigma q, right? But but when sigma q is equal to zero, this is just sigma. So they're holding capital. This is the fraction of the capital that they hold. This is the fraction of their net worth. So this, this ratio is, is their leverage, and this is basically the, the risk of, of their net worth. So basically, this is, this is the volatility of, of their net worth. Um, this is for experts. For households, uh, they hold capital fraction 1 minus psi. Their net worth share is 1 minus eta. And then this is... Uh, uh, this is their volatility of uh, net worth. Okay. And uh, something to observe is that suppose that they take uh, this part with uh, weight uh, eta and this part with weight 1 minus eta and I take the weighted average, right? Then I'm going to get the volatility of whole world wealth and if I take this weighted average with weight eta and y minus eta, then basically what I'm going to get is uh, uh, I'm going to get sigma. You can, you can
can see that I'm going to get sigma. So sigma is the so uh, so so it's actually the the volatility of world wealth is sigma plus sigma q, uh, but sigma q equals zero in in this case without adjusting. So then uh, the equation that I want to solve is uh, uh, A minus A underlined. And I'm, I'm sorry that I'm writing so low because it's just very hard for me to write high because I'm not Marcus. Is, uh, uh, so sigma uh, times psi over eta. Uh, minus 1 minus psi over 1 minus eta and times uh, sigma. So this is the difference in the uh, in the risk <coughs> okay. And from here you can get a closed form expression for the allocation of capital in this specific case. Uh, and uh, I'll just copy it from, from a paper because I'm trying to save my brain power for later. So psi equals eta plus uh, a minus a underline divided by sigma squared eta y minus eta. So basically it's a, it's a function that looks like this. It's a quadratic function. Let me write down that function. So, so it's a it's a quadratic function that equals to zero at uh, zero, and uh, at one, this is also zero. So this is equal to one at zero. So it's a, it's it's going to be a function which is quadratic. So it's a, it's a parabola with uh, downward branches. And let me uh, draw it on that graph. So, so it's, it, it looks like this, right? We take uh, we take the minimum because it can never be bigger than one. Uh, we take the we take the, the minimum of this and uh, and one. Okay. Basically, that's that's the function that we call. This, this chair might still be useful for the <laughs> Okay. Um, so. Uh, another example, or maybe even a couple of examples. How, how far are you from life? Okay. So maybe I have a, uh, have some time for for a couple of examples, and then we'll, we'll take a break. For It's uh, useful to uh, to introduce idiosyncratic risk because uh, uh, some models of uh, financial frictions they have uh, idiosyncratic risk in various forms, including the I theory of money, and and also uh, Sebastian Vitella has a paper on uncertainty shocks. Uh, so uncertainty shocks are shocks to idiosyncratic risk exposure, and then there are many uh, other examples. 
So, so let me give one example with uh, with idiosyncratic ring. So, um, and let me denote idiosyncratic risk by uh, sigma tilde. So, um, so this is going to be a world in which there are uh, households uh, and uh, They can hold this capital, uh, which has uh, uh, idiosyncratic risk, and uh, there are also intermediaries that basically can can help uh, households. Uh, Insure against this idiosyncratic risk by basically investing, investing in, in households. And uh, uh, let let's say that uh, 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 psi is the fraction of uh, this is basically the the stake of uh, intermediary. Take of intermediaries in individual projects of households and one minus the side. This is the take of a uh, household. Okay. Um, and uh, when households, when they invest in these projects, then uh, they have to uh, basically fully ab absorb this idiosyncratic risk, um, unless unless they pass it pass, pass on someone to intermediaries. But whatever they retain, they must fully absorb it. And then intermediaries, each intermediary specializes in uh, 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 basically uh, providing financing to basically a particular class of households, and then the intermediary can diversify risk among, among those households, and this diversification reduces risk. And the reduced risk is, uh, uh, let me denote it by uh, pi dzt. Okay, so basically pi is uh, uh, less than one, okay? It could be zero of intermediary to diversify this, this risk uh, fully, but uh, but an intermediary, the assumption here cannot uh, diversify this risk fully. Unless unless this is zero, then an intermediary can diversify this, this risk fully. Okay. And uh, the uh, let's say that output does not depend on Output does not depend on psi, um, and uh, Let's say that either there is no aggregate risk or uh, 
no risk sharing constraints for aggregate risk. So basically, the the aggregate shocks, like like uh, these shocks here, they are not a, a part of the equation. Okay. Uh, so in that case, uh, we are trying to minimize by choosing psi uh, the. This is the risk that uh, intermediaries are exposed to. Uh, and intermediaries, they have some risk premium on idiosyncratic risk. So this is uh, uh, beta tilde. Uh, and uh, this, is the, this is the share of households. This is the idiosyncratic risk that they're exposed to, and this is this is their, their risk premium on idiosyncratic risk. So you basically want to to minimize this. Uh, and uh, let me assume uh, CRRA utility. Okay. So uh, if uh, If utility is logarithmic, then the risk premium equals the volatility of wealth. Okay. Uh, if uh, utility is CRA, then what is tempting to say? It's tempting to say that uh, the risk premium equals the risk aversion coefficient times uh, the idiosyncratic volatility of wealth. Okay. And this is this is actually true. Okay. So this is this is this is actually true. Uh, so if uh, uh, you face some risk, and if you're a CRA agent, and if this risk is, uh, has no uh, relationship to future investment opportunities, okay, then uh, this is going to be a risk premium, but otherwise there's going to be a, a more general formula for risk premium which involves a, a value function. Okay. So the... The intermediary's exposure to this uh, idiosyncratic risk is uh, equal to uh, psi over eta times uh, sigma tilde. Okay, so just just like in, in this case, and, uh, but uh, but actually, what I should do is I before before plugging it in, I should take the first order condition, then I should plug it in. That's what they should be. Doing. So, uh, so let me take the first order condition. So the first order condition is uh, uh, phi sigma tilde uh, zeta tilde minus sigma tilde zeta tilde underlined equals zero, and then and then I plug in this condition. So I'm going to get phi times sigma tilde uh, times uh, psi over eta sigma tilde square oh sorry um, I forgot phi because, because the intermediaries are exposed to risk reduced by a factor of phi but the households they are exposed to risk which is not reduced by a factor of five. So this is sigma tilde. Uh, and then this is equal to, this is phi squared. This is equal to sigma tilde squared, one minus psi over one minus eta. And this implies that. Uh, <laughs> Put the gamma to one. Huh? Put the gamma to one. 
sorry, this is this is still gamma, and this is this is still gamma. So gamma is gamma is gamma is still there. So I could I could make gammas different. Let me make gammas different. Let me make this gamma gamma underline. So then this is gamma and this is gamma underline. So, So basically, then again, we have a closed form expression for uh, for the allocation of it between between households and uh, and exports. Okay. So uh, let's take a step back and let's you know basically think what what is going to happen. In this model, if there is also aggregate risk, so capital has some aggregate risk, but this uh, aggregate risk uh, it uh, it can be traded. So so there are some derivatives which basically allow people to uh, to share this aggregate risk uh, uh, fully. So then what's going to happen is that the uh, net worth share of experts uh, eta. Uh, if uh, if gamma and gamma underlined if they happen to be different, then the experts net worth share is going to fluctuate somehow. Um, and uh, and then uh, the experts net worth share fluctuates, and then you're going to have some states where the expert they absorb uh, uh, almost all of the idiosyncratic risk from households, and then you're going to have a uh, uh, some states where the experts' uh, wealth share becomes low because uh, they made some bets, because they make some bets because of the different risk aversion coefficients, um, and um, uh, and because of those bets, then uh, uh, the households are exposed to to a lot of idiosyncratic risk. Okay, and this uh, idiosyncratic risk exposure it's it's interesting because. Uh, Based on uh, idiosyncratic risk exposure, for example, it's possible to uh, build a, a theory of money, and this is something that they want to talk about uh, as well, uh, but probably after lunch. Um, so, something else which is which is also a technique that people have used is uh, uh, people introduce uh, uh, aggregate risk uh, and uh, so so okay so let, let me let me take a step back so so there is aggregate risk in the model okay so uh, in a uh, in a setting like this one. Uh, the frictions with respect to uh, how aggregate risk can be uh, can be shared between uh, uh, experts and households. Okay. Um, so, so in order to have um, some aggregate wealth dynamics, basically uh, aggregate shocks, they have to affect the wealth distribution, and in, in order. To, to have this, you either need to have uh, uh, frictions with respect to aggregate risk sharing, so the agents, they cannot uh, share aggregate risk perfectly, or if they, if they wanted to, then there would be some inefficiencies in this model. There would be inefficiency because uh, the aggregate risk is, is tied to capital that you hold, and uh, 
uh, to service perfectly households, they have to hold some of the capital proportions due to their networks. So you could have a situation where you could have models where uh, people cannot share aggregate risk uh, perfectly. There is a financial constraint with respect to that. Or you can have models where uh, people could share aggregate risk perfectly, but they choose not to. Okay? Uh, and uh, this you can have, well, so the easiest way to have it is basically to have different risk aversion coefficients, for example. Okay, so so it's uh, it's natural to think that well, you know, the households, uh, you know, they're quite risk averse. So you know, many people are you know poor. They uh, they're individually poor, so they're they're risk averse. And and the bankers maybe jointly they have limited wealth to to do their intermediation, but individually they're rich, so they're less risk averse. So they have a lower risk aversion condition. So this is one way to incorporate uh, basically aggregate dynamics into uh, this model. And then another way to do it, which um, I think tends to be even more tractable analytically, uh, but it's a little bit harder uh, to interpret if you want to interpret it from the point of view of welfare is a, a belief heterogeneity. So people assume that there are some aggregate shocks and uh, uh, different agents, they have different beliefs with respect to uh, basically, for example, the drift of it. And then people simply make bets uh, in the one group uh, and they both basically get exposed to, to this type of a, of a shock. Okay, but uh, let me come back to this and let me interpret this uh, equation uh, again. So what this equation is going to give is it's going to give a function which uh, uh, So it's above the 45 degree line, and, and it looks something like this. So the, the experts, they're going to, this is psi on the vertical axis and eta on the horizontal axis, and this is how much, uh, 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 how much of the idiosyncratic risk the experts absorb and they diversify. Uh, 